Hello, and welcome back to Stat 3050 online at the University of Wyoming. We are indoors, online, and, um, you know, it's a good time. It really is. It really is. Uh, so today, I want to talk a little bit about multiple linear regression. Uh, and I'm only going to talk just briefly on it, uh, because it turns out that a lot of the concepts that we learned in simple linear regression uh, is the same in multiple. Um, so let's go over just a little bit of the similarities, and we'll go over some differences too. Uh, not a lot of differences, which is, which is very nice for us. So um, recall, recall that in simple linear regression, we had one predictor and one outcome. Right, uh, and then we were able to plot the data, and it looks something like this, right? And we were able to draw a line through it, and we could say, okay, you know, for every change in x, for every change in x, y changed by this amount, whatever that value is, that beta one, and that's our slope, right? That's our slope, something along the lines of that, right? Okay, so in multiple linear regression, in multiple linear regression, we have the same thing. We have the same thing, except instead of just one predictor, we have multiple predictors. It looks something like this. Something like this, kind of difficult to imagine, and it's not too important that we get you know, this three-dimensional shape, but we're able to plot the data in the same way, except instead we have some x, one, some x, two, some x, three, some x, all the way up to however many x's we want, right? And then when we plot the data, if we were to plot the data, it's, instead of making a line, kind of makes this, kind of makes this plane here. Um, now this plane is very difficult to imagine and it, and it gets very, very hairy when we get more predictors added in. It kind of goes up into to a higher dimensional shape. Uh, of which we won't worry about too, too much because oftentimes regression, multiple regression, we never really plot anything. This is, this is really difficult to kind, of, uh, to kind of imagine. So instead, what we do is we just look at the overall, we look at the overall regression equation. So we're, we're given the same thing. We still have some y outcome and we still have an intercept, right? More or less of an intercept. And then we have our normal beta one, x one, and then maybe we have a beta two, x two, all the way out to, and I'm gonna say beta, I'm gonna say beta k, beta k, x k, okay. And so that all that is is just saying, you know, we can have some number, we can have any number of predictors, right? Um, as the predictor number increases, you know, the model becomes more complex, but that's all right. That's okay. And so what do we say? Well, we have some slope for our x1. We have another slope for our x2 and another slope, you know, all the way up to xk, right? And it's the same thing. It's the same thing. For every, you know, one unit increase in x or maybe some percentage change in x, y is going to change by whatever, you know, our beta 1 value is when, when we hold all others constant. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that we've got some regression equation and it looks like this, just putting it in general terms. I'm gonna write it up to three predictors here. Okay, so what do I mean by holding all others constant? Well, you can imagine that when we have some change in this x, we want to know how does this x individually, how does this x individually affect y? We say, holding these constant, holding the other predictors, holding the other predictors here constant, y changes by this beta one, just like always, right? So instead of saying for every one unit increase uh, of x, you know, changes y by beta one, we'll say holding all others constant, and then the same thing. For every one unit in increase in x, you know, y changes by this, this beta one. Uh, and the same thing goes for the other values too. And that's really it. That's really all that's different in multiple linear regression. We just have these extra coefficients here that are making things, you know, we're, we're getting more information from these extra predictors, right? Okay, so that's all good. We're all good there. 
let's talk about selecting variables. Let's talk about that. So we have this idea that, let's say that we have three variables that we're looking at. Uh, and I'll show you an example here in R in just a little bit. But we wanna figure out, okay, what, what variables do we actually need? Well, it's important to note that the p-values will change whenever we add or take away some predictor, right? So uh, let's just say, you know, just for right now, we have this, we have this regression equation. Hopefully I've given myself enough room here. Yes. Cool, okay. So beta one, beta two, and beta three, or x1, x2, and x3, right? Those are our three predictors, these x's here. And we want to figure out, okay, you know, what, what, which ones are important? Well, if we were to look at this whole model, if we were to look at this whole model, we would get p-values. We would get p-values for each of these slope coefficients. And of course, you know, one for the intercept as well. When we take away something, when we take away, let's say, this, this last predictor here, this x3, well then, given that this p-value is now gone, right, and this whole predictor is now gone, these predictors here have to pick up more of the slack, right? They have to pick up more of the slack, and they're going to be missing something, right? And so that's why, that's why these p-values change, and it might be for the better, it might be for the worse, we'll see examples of both, um, but we want to figure out, okay, how do we determine which ones are necessary? Well, that's a great, a great question. We have three, in this case, and for this class at least, <clears throat> we have three methods. So we have backward, forward, and exhaustive. This is also called um, sort of best subsets. Best subsets. And, and so we'll kind of get more into that in a little bit. These first two, backward and forward, have been used forever um, because it's fairly simple to do. And this exhaustive uh, was developed a while ago, um, but was very difficult to do because it was, you know, it took a lot of time to figure out by hand. Um, however, now that we have computers, this one is, is probably the best to use. But uh, let me show you sort of the, the pros and cons of, of each here. So we have what's called backward elimination, right? Okay, so let's say that we have some, we have some regression equation, right? It equals whatever. Um, and it goes all the way out to, we'll say, beta uh, 3, so what we do is we start with every predictor that we have, in this case, the three, right? And then we look at their p-values. And so let's say that, you know, let me actually write it down here. So we have beta one, uh, beta two, and beta three, right? We're looking at the slope coefficients. And let's say that the p-values for each are some range of, well, let's say beta one is 0.05, beta two is 0.07, uh, and then beta 3 is 0 0.001, we'll say, okay? So what we do in backward elimination is we say, okay, we've got these three p-values here. We'll take out the, the largest one first. So we were to take out this one. We take out beta 2. Well, then, now we're just left with beta 1 and beta 3. And when we do that, when we do that, the p-values are going to change in, in some way. Oops, not beta 2. We got rid of that. We got rid of beta 2, and we're using beta 3. We'll maybe find, we'll maybe find that now, you know, the p-values maybe have decreased or increased or, or who knows, right? Um, so we'll say that this is now 0.08. I'm totally making this up too. Totally making this up. And this is 0.03. Well, what we would do next, since 0.08 is below our alpha, we would get rid of that too, right? And then we're just left with, with beta 3. And that would, it, that's a totally legitimate way of doing it. Um, you never really have to do this by hand. The computer can do it. So, but that is one method of looking at model selection or, or variable selection, we'll say. Um, okay, so then we have this forward selection, this idea of forward selection. It's the total opposite of backward selection. You start with no variables in the model except for your, your x1. Maybe it's the first column, uh, maybe it's the last column or whatever, but you just start with one predictor. So you start, start with something like this. something like this, right? And then you get some p-value for this slope, and then you add in another one. And if that p-value is fine, if all the p-values are fine, then you add in another one. 
and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then you do it until there are no predictors that can be added that add to the significance of the model, right? So of course you don't want to add in a predictor that has a p-value over 0.05, right? Um, so essentially you're just looking at it from the opposite point of view of backward elimination. It's the same kind of deal. Now, um, the better of the three, the better of the three is this, is this exhaustive, and, and let me write it like this too, this best, this is the best subsets. I'm using the language in the library that we're going to be using, um, this option here, exhaustive, is, is just saying the same thing. Um, so you'll find that this exhaustive um, terminology here is very difficult to find online, um, but if you're more, more or less curious about the algorithm that it uses, you know, this is what you would search for, best subsets. Okay, so this first step is to open up R and then let the computer do all the work. It uses this, this fancy branch and bound algorithm. Um, we're not going to worry about those details. Uh, and then step two is you're still sitting back, you know, and maybe sipping on some coffee or something. Uh, and then the computer picks the best variables um, based on, you know, a bunch of different things. Uh, and then step three is you finish your coffee and then the computer's done. It takes literally moments. Um, and then that's it. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Um, okay, so let's say that you did it this way, or, or you did it in, in some way. It doesn't really matter, um, so long that you can back up your reasoning. But let's say that, oh man, you know, you, you get a model, and it turns out that you can use a bunch of different combinations of variables that are all significant. So let's say that you have, uh, let's say that you have five variables. Let's say that you have five predictors. And let me actually write it in that. Uh, so you have five, we'll say, um, predictors. Okay, so you have five predictors, very gracefully written there. Um, and it turns out that every combination, so let's say that you have a, a significant model um, with just one predictor, two predictors, three predictors, four predictors, five predictors, uh, in some combination, right? So you can have more than five models, right? You can have more than five models, but we'll just say that, that five models, they all have significant p-values for each variable, the slope of each variable. Um, and we want to figure out, well, which model is the best, not which variable is, is the best, or which combination of variables, but based on this combination of variables, which model is the best? Well, that's a great question. We have many methods of selecting models. So when we're looking at uh, different models, we are able to say, okay, we, well, we can look at the overall R squared of each model, right? The overall R squared. And so we want a really high R squared, um, for the, for the model, for our best model, ideally would have, a, would have the highest R squared. However, R squared is biased most of the time, right? And so we know that as the number of, you know, these beta one X one, as that increases, as that sort of, we'll just say goes off into infinity, right? Which it never will, but it could. We know that R squared is gonna go up right? We know that it's going to go up always, always. So this, this estimate, um, if you're doing it by hand is pretty easy, but we don't have to do that. Thank the Lord, right? So we'll get rid of this whole R squared business and we'll just look at the adjusted R squared. And we know that the adjusted R squared accounts for predictor numbers, the number of predictors in your model, and sample size too. But when we get into multiple regression or as we get into multiple regression, uh, it's, it's more so looking at the number of predictors that you have. So looking at this is a totally valid way of, of you know, sort of selecting a model. But we also have two other, two other estimates to look at as well. One of them is called the Akaike Information Criteria, or AIC. Um, he is one of the people I put on the syllabus at the beginning of the semester. So if you want to, you know, look at that again to kind of get an idea of who this is and who developed this, it's that fella. Um, and then we have the uh, Bayesian Information Criteria, the BIC, right? Doing sort of the same thing, doing sort of the same thing, but uh, um, slightly different, slightly different. But in this case, unlike R squared, adjusted R squared, we, where the higher is the better, right? You want a high adjusted R squared. In this case, you want 
a very small number for the AIC and a very small number compared to the other models that you're comparing, right? Uh, so not so much that you're not looking for, you know, a number really close to zero or whatever, um, because oftentimes you'll have situations where, you know, you have an AIC that's maybe in the thousands, right? Let's say that you get uh, a model that has an AIC of a thousand and your next model, model two, we'll say has a AIC or an AIC or a BIC or whatever of maybe 800, then you would pick model two even though the numbers are still pretty high. Now, another thing too, another thing too, is this, you know, a more negative, right? So we're looking at like smallness of these values, not necessarily like less than zero or, or close to zero or whatever. Um, so let's say that you get some model, let's say model one is, you know, negative uh, 250, and then model two is negative 300, and then model three, we'll say is, you know, 1.5 or whatever, uh, you would pick model two here because that's the smallest out of all of them. Kind of kind of confusing, um, but more or less, that's, that's sort of what the goal is with, with comparing AICs or BICs, same thing. Um, and, then, and then, let's say that you have two models. Let's say that model one, uh, is you know a simple y and it equals whatever and then model 2 is a log of y a log of y equals whatever right um, you cannot you cannot use really any of these to to determine which model is better you can't really do that um, because you're essentially you're essentially looking at things now in a different scale the, the sort of the rule is you have to be measuring you know the same outcome um, when you're comparing models with these estimates, um, which we're not doing anymore. When we have a log of y and y, even though we we know we know that you know the log of y is just a a, a transformation of the data. We're kind of rescaling it. Um, the way the math works out is that it's not valid to use any of these methods, um, which is fine. That's more that's more advanced. Uh, we won't really be getting into the details there. Um, but if you do run into a situation where you are comparing, you need maybe need to compare a model, um, a log y, log outcome, and just a normal outcome, um, and you get some pretty similar, you know, results, let's, let's recall and let's sort of remember, this is always good to uh, use in future classes, um, but oftentimes, I don't know what that is, <laughs> oftentimes, simpler is better. Simpler is, is best. So always remember that, especially in this class too. Um, there's no need to be super, super complicated with your models um, because oftentimes, so simpler is better, but a lot of the times you need to be explaining, you need to be explaining what you're doing. And then having a, having a model that has 80 predictors and, one of, and five of them are log transformed, the other are whatever transformed, and then your outcome is log transformed. You know, that's this whole thing that maybe you should take a step back and sort of re-evaluate what your purpose is. And if your purpose is making like a super accurate um, regression model for some outcome, then fine, you know. But also know that explaining things and explaining your reasoning and explaining the overall model and how per some predictor affects your why, your outcome, uh, oftentimes, you know, you want something simpler. Um, so just sort of keeping that in mind. So that's pretty much it for multiple regression. Nothing super crazy, nothing very difficult, right? Um, more or less, it's just simple linear regression, just more. Um, same, we have the same interpretation, right? Some unit increase in X, right, affects Y in some slope right, and by some, you know, beta one or beta two or whatever, but we have to hold all of the others constant. We saw, we saw here, right? So holding all others constant, x1 affects y in some way, right? Or x2 affects y in some way, right? And that's usually the slope coefficient that we're looking at. Um, okay, so just like always, just like always, we have an example in R coming up, uh, a few examples in R uh, for, model selection and whatnot. Um, but of course, if you have any questions, just let me know. If you have any comments, also just let me know. Uh, and I 
We'll see you next time.